What frames your life? How does each day begin? How does each day end? How does each week begin? How does it end? What about each year? What is it that frames your life? Is it, is it your work? Is it your family? Is it pleasure? Is it living for the weekend? Is it the search for a wife or for a husband? Such things, of course, they're not all bad. But when they form the very frame of your life, then everything within that frame is at least partly directed by it. If it's family, then the day, the week, the year, at the beginning and end with family. And so each day, each week, each year, it has that sort of family orientation. Everything is done with an eye to family. Or if it's pleasure, living for the weekend, then family and work, well, they're kind of just a sideshow. The main thing is Friday night, Saturday night. Everything is done with a view to getting through the rest of the week for those nights. If it's a search for a husband or a wife, then everything and everyone is sort of filtered through that frame and only potential marriage partners are giving your full attention. But what is it that frames a Christian life? What is it that directs the life of the Christian? How does a Christian start the day, end the day? How do God's people begin and end their week? What is the directing principle of the Christian life? And maybe now the memory of your shorter catechism is being recalled and you're thinking, that sounds a bit like, what is man's chief end? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But tonight I want to sort of compress that summary statement even more as we begin. Squeeze it into just one word. What's it all about? Worship. Worship. Worship is what it's all about. Worship is what frames the Christian life. And such is what we find in our passage of scripture this evening. We read from verse 19 to 28, and it begins and ends uh, with worship. Verse 19, then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. And in verse 28, so they worshipped the Lord there. In this passage then that we're looking, uh, that's how they began. Uh, and it's how, how it ends. And certainly for Hannah, worship frames her life. She lives for the Lord. Okay, we saw last time that this particular family was not the epitome of godliness. Israel was at a low ebb spiritually. Last time we saw some of the half-heartedness within the family. We saw rivalry. We saw suffering. But Hannah was committed to the Lord and her life was laid out for us in these verses. I think they fit neatly within this frame of worship. And so our remit tonight is really to ask just one question. What's inside the frame? What's inside the life of worship? Because I believe this passage teaches us four essentials in the Christian life. The first is found in verses 19 and 20. Simply it's answered prayer. What a brilliant thing. Hannah had prayed in verse 11, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And now in verse 19, the Lord remembers her. Yes, we're told that the baby was conceived in the usual way with Elkanah, her husband. But they had tried for a baby before without any joy. This time it's different. This time Hannah had prayed specifically and earnestly and persistently. And Hannah herself now sees this baby now born is only born because of God's grace. We saw last time that children, all children are a blessing from the Lord. They are gifts from God. But this particular child, in a sense, is a special blessing because he is also an answer to prayer. And the life of worship is marked by 
answered prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Jesus said again, John 14, 13 and 14, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Well, is that your life then, tonight? Is it one of answered prayer? Now, answered prayer starts with asking in prayer. Corporately, I think we're not, we're not doing so well at present. Some of our last prayer meetings have we been a bit thin on the ground. And I know not everyone can come to the prayer meeting. But I think we need to be careful there just as a congregation, as an indicator of spiritual temperature. I think it's a little warning sign for us. It was a life of worship that is marked by answered prayer. And so we begin by praying. What about your family? Are you praying with your husband or with your wife? Are you praying with your children? Are you praying for your children? And then what about privately? On your own or in the closet as Jesus referred to it? You you cannot ever expect to live a life of answered prayer if you're not spending time in prayer. It just can't happen. Are you praying for the honouring of God's name? For the extension of his kingdom, for his will to be done. Are you praying for daily provision? Are you praying for forgiveness while promising to forgive others? Are you praying for strength not to be tempted? Praying for deliverance from sin? Are you praying for the sake of Jesus and his kingdom and his power and his glory? And you'll recognize that, I'm sure. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. His brother James said in James 4 verse 3, You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Again, we we need to be careful that we're praying for the things that Jesus wants us to pray for. He has taught us how to pray. But maybe, maybe you are praying Jesus' way, and you still wonder if you're being heard. Maybe there are certain prayers that you've been praying earnestly and repeatedly and persistently and yet there seems to be no answer God always answers the problem lies in the fact that we don't always like the answer God may be saying no and he may be saying not yet But for sure he always hears and he always answers prayer. And we must remember that God knows what is best. And he wants that for us. The devil doesn't want you to know that. But isn't that the truth? That's our God. He knows what is best and he wants that for his people. That's our God. Keep praying. God's answer to Hannah was, not yet, not yet, not yet, for years and years. And there's Penina, who wasn't good mum material at all, and she has a load of children. And I'm sure to Hannah, her prayers, uh, the answer to them just felt like no. But in the end, while Hannah persisted in prayer, God's answer in his perfect timing changed from Not yet. To yes. And she got her boy. And Hannah couldn't have chosen a better name for her first boy. Samuel. Samuel means both asked of God and heard of God. It's like the perfect name for the first in a whole line of prophets that God was going to send to his people. His very name testified to the power of prayer. God's people had to pray and pray in the knowledge that they will be heard. Asked of God, heard of God. Such is the life of worship. 
second thing is faithful service. Verses 21 to 23. And it looks different for Elkanah as it does to Hannah. In verse 21, Elkanah, she, he goes to the tabernacle to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. And we kind of think, well, what's his vow? The only vow we've heard in this story is the vow of Hannah in verse 11. And such a vow Elkanah as her husband could have overturned according to Numbers chapter 30. But it appears here that he has certainly not overturned it. Instead, he has committed himself to that same vow. And he's serious about it. You see him there in verse 21. He's reminding Hannah of it. And Hannah has to explain her actions of not going up to the tabernacle in verse 22. Now we'll come to Hannah in a moment. But note Elkanah here. Again, verse 23, he's been I think he's beginning to understand what he didn't before. In verse, in verse 8 that we saw last Sunday night, he thought that Hannah should cheer up. After all, wasn't he better to her than, than ten sons? But now he says to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. And I can't help but think that Elkanah has learned something from Hannah. He has seen her faith in action. He has heard of her vow and he's seen the Lord answer her prayer. She was barren and they knew it for all the children that Penina had. She remained barren but now God has answered. He's done the impossible. And Elkanah's faith, I do believe, has been reinvigorated. It's been enlivened and her vow is now gladly taken on by him. And he's keen that it's kept. Only let the Lord establish his word. And that's certainly clear from the text before us. His motivation in his service is that the Lord will establish his word. He's sure of that. And it is within that sort of awesome supernatural sovereignty of God as seen in the baby being born that Elkanah sees his and Hannah's responsibility to keep their word and to fulfill their vow they must not renege on giving their boy to the Lord the sovereign promises of God they create a responsibility for God's people God has promised to save his people. But they must repent and believe. God has promised to forgive our sins. But we must confess them to the Lord. God has promised to draw near to his people. But they must draw near to him. God has promised them perfect peace. But their minds must be fixed on him. God has promised to give. But they are to ask and to seek and to knock. God has promised to be their keeper. But they must look to him and cry out to him. Faithful service rests upon the sovereignty of God. But it is always more than a let go and let God thing. Elkanah saw that God establishing his word meant that he and Hannah must fulfill their God-given responsibility and the biggest part of that in the Christian life is something that we have seen already we must faithfully serve the Lord in prayer only let the Lord establish his word from our perspective that means praying thy kingdom come and we do so in the knowledge that because God is king his kingdom certainly will come. <coughs> Hannah's faithful service looks a bit different. Uh, she too is fulfilling her vows. Elkanah is maybe a bit fearful and wants to be sure that Hannah will give the boy to the Lord as promised. I think we can also tell from verse 23 that he does trust her. His words, do what seems best to you. That reveals a real spiritual trust. That is, in this spiritual matter, in this keeping of vows before the Lord, Elkanah trusts Hannah 
to do the right thing at the right time. Hannah, she is determined to keep her vow. But surely she is tempted. Tempted to delay and hang on to Samuel for another year. Maybe just another year. Maybe another year. And year after year could go by. But no, she is, she's committed to bringing Samuel to the tabernacle as soon as he is weaned. She's practical about it. And then, verse 22, she will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. That's her goal. That's what she's working towards. She is fulfilling her vow to the Lord. And in doing so, uh, she is, to quote Elkanah, letting the Lord establish his word. What does that faithful service look like in her life? Dirty nappies, sleepless nights, a whole load of laundry, exhaustion. Also great joy and wonder and love and devotion. It looks like hugs and kisses. It looks like warnings and smacks. It looks like persevering with mashing up fruit and veg until he actually eats the stuff. It looks like normal bringing up a baby boy. You see, it's more than that. It is faithful service to the Lord her God. And Christian mums and dads, this is a big part of your Christian service. Bring up your children in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. Train them up in the way that they should go. Yes, it looks ordinary. Most of the struggles are just the same as every other family on your street. But the Christian has a different goal. You're bringing them up for the Lord. And your greatest desire is that they would belong to the Lord Jesus. God has made promises about that too. Promises to you and to your children forever. But it is within that sovereign promise of God that you have to take your responsibility seriously. And so it starts off at their baptism You bring them up, you make these promises at baptism uh, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition, love and discipline of the Lord. You promise to pray for them and with them regularly. You promise to teach them the Bible. You promise to set before them a godly example of what it means to be a child of God. That's faithful service. It's doing every sort of ordinary thing with an eye to the glory of God. May just be raising children at home. Or the grandkids when they come in as well. Setting them godly example. Faithful service can simply be faithful to the Lord when you're at work, in the office, on the factory floor. Maybe teaching a class or driving a taxi. But as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. When it's done with an eye to his glory, then ordinary things become faithful service. Third thing, verse 24 and 25, is looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. Uh, True Christian worship is only possible because of what God has done for us in Christ. Every other religion in the world, it's about doing But true Christianity is about what God has done for us in Christ. And I think every other religion in the world would be happy with a need for prayer and a need for faithful service. But true worship needs something more than that. It needs Jesus. We only love God because he has first loved us. And that great sacrificial love is fully displayed at the cross of Calvary. And we lingered there this morning. And it was good for our souls. But the shadow of the cross, it's here. Verses 24 and 25. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bulls, one ephah of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. It's a great sacrifice. The things she brings. It's over and above what is necessary. One bull will have done. 
But because the sacrifice is so great, it leaves us in no doubt that Hannah is not doing this grudgingly. She's not been forced into this by Elkanah. No, this is willing, happy obedience. It's generous giving to the Lord. And we might be tempted to think, well, she's given her firstborn son to the Lord. Surely the three bulls can appeal into insignificance in the light of that, that she's given her boy over to the Lord for all his days. Yes, th- this is a large sacrifice, but is, is it not trumped by the giving up of Samuel? But you see, this is different. This is a blood sacrifice we're seeing. And that means something unique, doesn't it? You know this. There's a confession here that without shedding of blood there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. And yes, we Samuel here, I'm sure he's all innocent and all of that there and butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. But he's a wee sinner. Yes, he's probably only three or four years old. But if he is to stand and minister in the presence of God, blood must be shed. Sin must be covered. His sin must be paid for. And the blood of bulls and goats cannot pay for sin. But God ordained such to be signposts, pointing his Old Testament people forward to the once for all sacrifice that he would provide. Jesus. And just as Hannah and Elkanah willingly brought this great sacrifice to the tabernacle, God would in time willingly Give his only begotten son. And he would cover and pay for the sins of all his people. It was all in the future for for Samuel and for his parents. But that's where they're looking. They're looking forward to the coming of the one final true sacrifice. They're looking forward to Christ. And he is always the central focus of worship. It's true in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. There has only ever been one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Only him. True worship depends on Jesus. That's true while you're sitting here in church. If I'm not showing you Jesus, then I am not helping you worship the Lord. And the same is true for everyday worship as well. We must be looking to Jesus. How can you raise godly children in an ungodly world? How can you drive a taxi or teach a class to the glory of God? How can you show the love of God to the weakling in the class? How can you yourself joy in the worship of God? And it's only by looking to Jesus. It's all in him. You need to see the lengths that God has went to to save you from sin. You need to see his ungrudging, willing, happy, generous love. You need to see that your sins because of Jesus are gone. That they're gone forever. You need to know that the pardon he provides, it is full We need to look to the altar that really counts. To the cross of Jesus. That's only in the shadow of the cross that we can ever hope to live a life of worship. And finally, verses 26 to 28, glad surrender. Hannah brings her little boy Samuel to Eli. Verse 26, she reminds him of the past. O my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. What a sad reminder of the times they lived in when someone praying to the Lord publicly at the tabernacle was a thing that prompted his memory. It was a rare event. That was her past. That's what really happened. She really had come there and stood and prayed and poured out her soul. Verse 15, poured out her soul to the Lord. That's what she did. And now the present, verse 27. Here he is. For this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. 
And just as Eli didn't see many people praying in and around the temple, it was clear then that he didn't see many answers to prayer like this. But in Hannah's case, she did pray. And the answer is this little boy standing beside her. Verse 28 is the future, the future which she has promised to the Lord some four years or so ago. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord there. She does it. She fulfills her vow and she gives her boy to the Lord. Now, Shiloh is where the tabernacle of God is. It's not an attractive place. Eli, he is the priest of God. He's a very old man. When it comes to his track record of rearing children, to say not so good would be a bit of a massive understatement. We saw his two wicked sons last time. We'll see them again next time, God willing. We don't want to pin all the sins of the sons onto the father. But from the outside looking in, it must have been very hard for Hannah to leave her wee boy with this old man and these two wicked sons in the background. I think if that was today, social services wouldn't let it happen at all. But Hannah wanted it to happen. She had prayed, God had answered, and God was in this. It was God's will that young Samuel should now live in this socially questionable place. But in the end, Hannah did more than leave her boy at a place. She left her boy with the Lord. She had weaned him. She had started him off on the road to godly service. I do believe she had given him something that would always stand by him, no matter what he faced. She gave him a great name. Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. His name is Samuel. Asked of God, heard of God. He existed because his mother asked of God and was heard of God. And throughout his life, his very name would remind him he could do the same. He could ask of God. He would be heard of God. And we'll see it. He did it. He could simply fold his hands and pray. And God would hear him. Hannah left her boy in the Lord's hands. I wonder, have you left your children there? Have you given them to the Lord? Might seem dangerous. Shiloh did. What if God calls them into missionary work somewhere very far away? Would you let them go? What if God called them into a dangerous work? Remember, they can always ask of God and be heard of God. Are you willing To surrender them to the Lord. And what about you yourself? Would you give yourself in service to God? Will you devote your life to faithful service? Would you gladly surrender your life to the Lord Jesus? Jesus said... If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It was Jim Elliot who said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. To gain what he cannot lose. Such surrender here. We might marvel at it in Hannah. But it is a glad surrender. Look down at chapter 2. How does it begin? She starts to pray. My heart rejoices in the Lord. 
That kind of joy is only for those who surrender their life to the Lord. And their life is one of true worship. Answered prayer, faithful service, glad surrender. And it's all made possible because they're looking unto Jesus. So it's my joy tonight to simply say, look again to him. Look again to your Lord and Saviour and surrender everything to him. Things that maybe are out of your control, surrender it all to the Lord. Commit your children to him. Commit your life to him. Look to Jesus. Amen. Let's pray, please.